six thirty. We have a quorum. We'll call a planning board meeting to order. And first up for general information, Mr. Dwyer, you're muted. That would be Mr. Parmar. Hello, good evening. Um, this is in regards to the project, the uh, new Marriott Town Place we have at 237 Russell Street. Um, we noticed some discrepancies on our plan or the architect had, um, the architect was working to a uh, national architect. And when we submitted the plans um, from Berkshire Design, we had 15 foot poles and the architect had drawn 25 foot poles, um, which is similar to what we have at the other properties at, uh, at the Hampton Inn and the Homewood Suites. Our question is essentially um, keeping the 25 foot poles would reduce the number of poles we have to put up and the cost. So we're wondering if there's any relief or exception allowing us to put in those 25 foot light poles. Um, the lighting would still be the dark sky down lighting as um, we would still um, confirm to those rules. So that's a general question that we have. Is the uh, so the the plan you submitted? Let me let me ask the question. Um, the plan you submitted was based on twenty five foot poles, fifteen foot poles, fifteen foot poles. What what I'm saying is the photo metrics that were shown were that based on the twenty five or the fifteen? I believe the fifteen, but uh, we resubmitted um, the photometrics with recently i think berkshire design was supposed to send them over with the 25 foot pole um photometric layout i believe i sent that around to everyone i i, I personally don't see an issue with the 25 foot pole but i'm not sure how the rest of the board feels i wonder how the neighbors feel that's I don't have a problem with it. I don't either. What um uh, what were the poles in the on the site before you demolished the old building? Those were know? twenty those were twenty five foot poles too. Okay, well, I will not, I'm going to give up looking for uh, my, my search function in Outlook is just not working well tonight. So I'm not going to try to dig that out, but I think I did send it around to everyone. The, something for Berkshire Design. When would that have gone around? Mr. Uh, last two weeks. See if I can. Do you want me to forward it right now? I would yeah, have it here. Monday, three twenty-five. You sent it. Okay. Let me see if I can pull it up. It was around twelve oh eight um, in the afternoon that I think Chris Chamberlain from Berkshire Design sent it. Uh, okay. Yeah, I have it from. Okay. Uh, let me see if what we can do here. Okay, uh, if someone else can bring it up, uh, I I'm just not getting anything in Outlook. Just says it can't the message can't be displayed right now. All right. Um you want to give me an actual bill, see if I can yep. bring it up. 
I will. Okay, should be set. Okay, I got it in finals. No. All right. Give me a second. Trying to bring it up my email, it didn't work. I have it up if you want me to share it or yeah if you can share it because I'm, I'm i'm having trouble bringing it up for some reason hold on one second let me make it Mm. Who are the butters? Is that like uh, Wildwood and uh, Eaton surveyors or something? I'm trying to. Yeah, Randy Iser is one of the butters, and the other side, I forgot what they're called. Um, Hadley Park Plaza. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. right. Also, uh, Lisa Sanderson's um, yeah. right. shop, but there are also residential abutters beyond the uh, yeah. uh, into the rear. Yeah, and um, the building is more towards the rear. Um, so most of the light poles are in the north side or the Route Nine side of it. Um, in the front, right? In the front, so the building kind of blocks it. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we're reducing the number of light bulbs instead of increasing them. But the photometrics are the photometrics with different twenty-five poles in it. Um, so, but that, you said the previous poles were twenty-five feet, so we're not doing it. You're not making things any worse. No, and most of the poles were. Previously, the building was elongated on either side, well, one side and the other side was a smaller building. So there was more lighting back then than there is now. For my opinion, but the photometrics, I don't think I have a photometric comparison from the previous layout. So am I seeing seven poles in the front, one next to the building, and then three five in the back looks like five in the back yeah, Mo yeah. around the, the the uh back side and and most of the lights are in in the point one to point five range a couple point sevens so if you're looking at the diagram to the to the left is the plaza to the right is where uh, Ian and Associates and um, Wildwood Barbecue are. To the top or north, north, um, southeast, which is the uh, top left corner, that's where the wetlands are. And beyond that is where Natural Road is. To the southwest is the residence where my parents stay. And then Nashville Road. So it looks like around three at the entry goes up to four and then comes down towards two foot candles.
Well, I'll make a motion to approve substitution of 25 foot poles for 15 foot poles. Second. Motion and second. Any other discussion from anybody? Comments? Yeah. Yeah. Can we, um, would we be out of line to uh, push this to next meeting so that the all the abutters have a chance to weigh in? Because I'm not sure that Lisa is aware of this. Lisa or Argus? Yeah. If, if I could make a comment. Yeah. Sure. Uh, um, along the, uh, I guess it'd be the east side is my, my building and parking lot. 20 years ago, when I built my building, I planted a bunch of white pines and they're like 35 almost 40 feet tall now so that kind of shields my whole side of the building from any lights uh, and it goes all along that that one side my building all the way back to the wetland so that might help mitigate any you know it might be considered uh you know the, the lighting that might shine through so it's not really going to affect me and i'm probably i may be the largest of butter so I don't really have a problem with it myself. Lisa's is it more towards the front. I guess you should maybe give, you know, let her weigh in on it, but it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't she, affect me. She isn't, I mean, I can't speak for her, but I know she is like a nine to five business or a nine to six business. Um, and we do, I mean, to be, you know, she, she sometimes, we allow them to park sometimes and share a parking lot. So I don't think she'll, she'll have too much of an issue, but if you want to yeah. ask her, yeah. yeah, I also don't think that the east is a big side of of windows for her, um, but that's just my impression. I could be, you know, I'm not her. So, I mean, I'm not overly concerned. I just, yeah. I, I, I'm yeah. not sure that the business is going to have a big concern if their parking lots are a little bit illuminated. Yeah. It's going to, it would be anybody to the rear where the residences are. Right. And it seems like that's pretty well blocked off the real okay. very low light number is there probably better than it used to be okay all right i'm done with my discussion then okay good point though any other comments hearing none all in favor aye aye, aye. any opposed aye. motion passes unanimously okay you, folks very good All right, so next in was Ken Wood. Under the heading of Millimeter Wave. Millimeter Wave Systems. Millimeter Wave, you are up. I don't think I'm on the agenda at all. Well, if, if you just have general questions, that's fine. If you just want to watch the yeah, yeah, watch the yeah. uh, meeting, that's also okay. We just okay. we just want to know if you're here for anything, any general questions. No, I'm just listening. Okay. That's all. All right. And uh, Josh Klein was up next. Uh, good evening. Um, thank you for having us again, Josh Klein, Stonefield Engineering, Site Civil, Traffic engineer for the project. Um, so we're we're happy to be back because it means we are very close to starting to break ground. So we have a contractor on board. We've done our pre-site walkthrough. And the real the reason we're here Re tonight remind is, us of the street address and the project. Yeah. Yes. We're on we're within the Hampshire Mall 375 Russell Street is the address. This is the Chase Bank project. So I'll just I'll put it up on my screen as I'm I'm talking. I have a, a side by side, but essentially we reached out to the building department as we gear up for construction. We've met with Mass DOT and had a bunch of conversations with Mass DOT um, because we want to kind of ensure we're aligned with the work. So the question that we presented to the building department was Chase was just kind of looking for clarification that you know as Mass DOT completes their improvements. 
it, you know, that we want to ensure that none of the mass DOT improvements are going to hold up Chase's ability to open their doors. You know, for example, um, I'll just zoom in. This is the plan on the left was the approved site plan. Mass DOT is building a new sidewalk over along South Maple Street after they do um, the expansion. They probably won't finish that sidewalk realistically. You know, I, I wish DOT, you know, stayed on a quicker schedule, but they probably won't finish that sidewalk till a little bit after our project's done. So, you know, Chase is just kind of an abundance of caution, you know, wanted us to kind of reach out and ensure that, you know, the town, um, you know, would issue a CO and let Chase open and operate, you know, while Mass DOT is finishing improvements that are associated with Mass DOT scope. Um, what that kind of conversation I think led to, and there might have been a little confusion along the way, was that, you know, the, the site plan set that was dated um, that in front of the board and the site plan set that we're going into construction with is just is a different date. Um, so I think what we felt like it was best to get in front of the board and just to clarify that the all the mass DOT improvements that the board saw when they approved the set are exactly the same they are now. We actually met with mass DOT um, to confirm that their plans haven't changed since this board approved it. So property lines are the same, improvements are the same. Our plans have changed, you know, typical to any of these projects. Once we go from board approval to gearing up for construction, um, for example, we've made some some really minor changes. And, you know, the only one that you can you, you'll actually see above ground was we the ADA space um, was shifted over slightly um, to minimize the conflict of the ramp with the front door. Um, but buildings in the same place, coverages are the same, setbacks are the same, parking's the same. You know, I could the list goes on and on um, from a zoning perspective. You know, another change I could just highlight is, you know, Chase added a, a concrete um, flag where the ATM is. So a car is kind of sitting on a concrete flag versus asphalt. You can see in the proof set. So, you know, we just want to come in here. I don't, I don't know if the, you know, kind of leave it to the board if there's any action that's needed. I don't know if the board wants to kind of amend it to include this set. It seems atypical, but this was more, I think, you know, kind of getting clarification that the board, you know, knows that the latest set, um, you know, from a site plan approval perspective matches the set that they approved as we gear up for construction. And then just getting confirmation that, um, you know, the, the board is comfortable with the idea that, you know, Chase, for example, you know, is going to build the new sidewalk to the edge of their property, but we obviously aren't going to be able to construct the mass DOT sidewalk. So when the mass DOT comes in and finishes their sidewalk, they'll connect it to that flag that we have there. So that was probably the only, um, you know, one of the only items that, you know, DOT will touch in after, you know, we went out in the field and confirmed, you know, utility poles and things are all in the same place. So um, happy to answer any questions. I don't know if, you know, Bill, there's any action you you feel? I know Giovanni from our office was kind of in touch with you, but we did want to kind of get this, you know, in front of the board as we we get ready to break ground. Would it be easy enough to just submit a uh, a typed list of what's changed? You know, just like a list of amendments and file that. Yeah, if if, if that is something, we could kind of like something to put in the folder. We're happy to do that. And who's going to be, be using that sidewalk that you're going to be building? So, you know, because the sidewalk is there and being built per ADA code, we have to provide a connection to it uh, to ensure ADA accessible access. I don't foresee that sidewalk will be very popular. Unless you're going to the bank on your bike. Exactly. And the good news is we do have bike racks out front. So you shouldn't be riding your bike on the sidewalk anyway. <laughs> well, aren't we getting a multi-use or something? Anyway, yeah. Um, any other comment? I mean, I don't know if we I know. Do we do we need to approve that those changes are so minor, Mr. Bill? Do you think we need to do even take make our a, a, you know, I, I don't think we have to do it on an item by item basis, but I like uh, uh, Mark's suggestion of just keep us updated with a running list of what the changes are um, between the originally approved and 
the final, uh, as long as it doesn't affect setbacks or footprint, I, I'm okay with it, but we do like to have a what we see is what we get approach to uh, approving site plans. So um, you know, when they when you start putting in changes like this, yes, we would like to just have a record of them. And I see that uh, Mr. Quinlan has his hand up, Jim. Okay, I. I can't see. Okay, Mr. Tom, Mr. Quinlan. Yes, I, I guess um, and through one of the emails, Josh, I'm not sure who it was that the state hasn't completed the taking of the that it could change the what they're going to take for property. So I guess from the building uh, department, our, my question was if it, the building was to become non-conforming, non-compliant because they took more property, um, not being an existing building and all, how in that case, it would be able to give a CO. Um, that was our question to, I believe it was the contractor that applied. If, if the uh, town would be covered by just putting it at your own risk, that the, you know, as far as issuing the permit, at your own risk, if the state was to take new property and you became non conforming, not complying, you would be at that point going to the ZBA for a, a variance. Well, I think there's there's two parts there. So the the takenings and the easements have been recorded. So the takenings have taken place and easements, you know, have taken place and those are recorded. So we're not aware of, of any outstanding takenings or easements or anything like that. I just want to be very clear that all of that has taken place. It has been recorded and the plans do reflect it. Now I think that, you know, a scenario, the you know, this I guess a what if scenario, right? You know, think of you know kind of would apply with general land use law anywhere in town. You know, if the state came in and, you know, took a chunk of your property and made your site non-conforming, I don't think it's the the applicant, you know, right to bear um, that they would have to, you know, go to the ZBA. I think there would, you know, technically you, you can make an argument that the that the mass DOT in that process would have to be responsible for it. But I don't I don't think that would have that what if scenario would affect our planning board approval. I think it would you know, have to be addressed in the future if if it in fact happened. No. Yeah, I, I guess my question was because this is not existent right now. So the others are all sitting there. They they didn't have a choice. So that was just a question I wanted to bring up. So as long as um putting that stipulation, I guess, in the um, you know, in the permit and everybody was okay with it, just want to cover the town, that's all. Because this is not built yet. Is <laughs> And we could bring in a link like the town council. I don't know if the town can condition a building permit on something like that. The, of, a, of a future, you know, because that would be, um, you know, something I think that would be, I guess, unfair to, an, to any applicant, right? I mean, if a, the state is required to take a small piece of our land from a public safety perspective, um, you know, I think we're looking... I don't think the building permit should be conditioned on it. I guess would be my stance. So, so are you are you asking us to incur the town to incur a legal expense to approve your project? No, not at all. I, I think I think we're we're asking maybe this the board and 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 kind of to review the ideas. You know, I think this condition was not a condition of our planning board approval. We have a site plan decision that was in effect. We have property lines that are in effect that are recorded that are signed and sealed by a licensed surveyor. I think adding conditions after the fact to an application that's been approved seems like an unfair hardship we're setting on the bank for a scenario that, you know, is kind of being created. It's not a real scenario. If you were buying, say, the an existing site that was already non-compliant, that we wouldn't be having this conversation, but you're going into this with, actual notice that the environment is um, unsettled. So am I, I'm hearing Josh say that the takings are all set, but it, would I be, I don't know if anyone can answer this, but it, I'm, I'm wondering if the state doesn't consider those final till it's over like like well we if we find that we have a change order or some problem we'll take more 
Is that? No, that's so the the state has the takings that we have to come to an agreement. I guess I guess the first the state can't just come and take your property. Um, they have to go through the process to do it. That process has been done. Agreements have been made and executed by the Hampshire Mall, and they've been recorded. So the state can't just decide tomorrow that they want to take more land. You know, they'd have to come to an agreement, you know, with the property owner. Well, no, this, they, that's not that's not the law at all. They can take more land if they want to. They don't. But need, they have to go through the process. They have to go through the process. Correct. But they don't re need the permission of the landowner to do that. If they decide they need it for the public good, they will take it for the public good, and we'll sort out what compensation to the land uh, owner is after the fact. Correct. They have to come to an agreement, which they they have done, and an agreement has been made and it has been recorded. If the um, state did that, would they be creating a hardship for Chase after the fact? I would say at this time we have we have the property lines are shown correctly, the setbacks are shown correctly, the takings have all taken place. We have the construction plans for Mass DOT. We've messed with Mass DOT. This scenario that uh, Mr. Quinlan has brought up is not a real scenario. So, you know, again, I, you know, as, as a professional engineer, I, I can't speak to what if scenarios, you know, what if a, you know, a, a hurricane comes and, you know, wipes out, you know, all the buildings in this area, we have to rebuild them like these, you know, again, we, we have to work with what we have and what we have is correct property lines an approved plan. And we have DOT construction plans that they're actively working off of that match the plan that was approved by the board. Well, then in that case, I would say that you shouldn't be worried about the caveat that Mr. Quinlan asked for because it's not going to happen in your scenario. He's just saying, if the worst happens, I'm protecting the town. And you're saying the worst isn't going to happen. So it sounds like we're all happy here. Yeah, well, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, I guess, advocate for the applicant because, again, you know, I think I think it's a the request being made is is not a typical request. Um, it's not standard, and it, it wasn't conditioned to this board's approval. I think if this was raised during the site plan approval process, and this was conditioned to our original site plan approval, you know, I think we would be more understanding. It would have been something well, we would have talked well, about well, the, and we would have worked through. This board's approval is subject to a number of other boards in town giving their approval. Mm -hmm. So if you had come to us tonight and said, we've changed the plan because Mass Dot's taking an extra five feet for their sidewalk because they want to make it a multi-use sidewalk, um, then we'd be saying, well, you'd probably need a variance. I mean, I think in this case, Chase is, Chase is trying to uh, force this. This is a, an unbuilt site. You can wait until the dust settles. Well, I guess I guess let me clarify that because that, that, it's not what we're saying is if if the state were to come to us and say we need to take 10 feet of our property, then, you know, this kind of falls to Mr. Quinlan's point. We would have to come back to this board and explain it and address it at that time. So we we couldn't just ignore the fact that the state was taking property. But I think we're kind of like getting ahead. We're like, you know, we're the horse before the carriage. We're we're almost, you know we're kind of saying this what if scenario is going to happen, like is going to happen bef before anything has. I think it's it's a concern that was raised and I, I think it's valid, right? I think if we were in a situation where we didn't have takenings recorded, we didn't have easements recorded, we didn't have DOT already under construction of this project, I think we'd be in a much different scenario. Um, but regardless in the way the approval's written, you're totally right, Mr. Dwyer. If the state comes in, in takes a portion of our property and it triggers additional approvals or changes to our site plan, we have to be back in front of this board. So that's why I think it's a it's it's creating a condition um, that's outside of what was already conditioned in our original approval and 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 is kind of you know I guess uncharacteristic um, of other applications or other even applications I've worked on in town. Any idea when the state is going to start doing stuff on South Maple Street? 
that they're already doing work. They're staging equipment. They've started doing work in that area. I'm not quite sure what we should do, Mr. Dwyer. What do you think? Um, a little. I think we're we're being pressured by Chase's desire to move ahead without knowing that the coast is clear. But uh, if that's at their own risk, um, I guess that they're they're it's a business decision they can make. Can I, can I just ask a, a question? Sorry, through the chair. Sure. M Mr. Quinlan, is there is there some reason you believe that there's a takening that's going to happen with this application? It was brought up in an email from somebody from, you know, the permit application that it could be, you know, taking more, you know, months ago. And it was just, I'm just out to protect the town. I want to issue this permit tomorrow. I just uh, just wanted to cover the town if this should happen because it is a you know a new structure and believe me I want to see this permit issued immediately but it's just out to save the town in case yeah, I, I, so I haven't I haven't seen the the correspondence being being referenced and I know I've reviewed all the correspondence from from our team and the project team that's gone out but I I guess I will make it very very clear that there's there is no we have had zero um, correspondence through our meetings with MassDOT. We've, through our evaluation of multiple sets of their plans, through our ongoing, we're actively in communication with the project engineer from MassDOT during our field me meetings and our field visits that there's any been any inclination for over the course of the last two years that our office has been working on this project that there is going to be a change in the takings or the agreements. Obviously, Chase's going to be investing a lot of money in this area and they wouldn't be moving forward if there was any risk associated. I mean, this is, you know, they're, you know, they, um, they don't take, you know, banks, we work with a lot of banks, not just Chase. I mean, they don't take risk lightly. They're going to make a large investment in Hampshire Mall. Hampshire Mall obviously wouldn't want to, you know, one of their future tenants, you know, kind of an anchor on this corner um, to run into an issue. So that's what I, I, I wanted to ask Mr. Clinton. I just wanted to clear the air that you know, we've we're we are actively in touch with DOT, and that has hasn't been that has never come up in any of our correspondence meetings or discussions over the last you know two years. Did you ever ask them if there was the potential of a further taking? Yes, we did a very extensive due diligence process, and that's what took us so long to kind of even get in front of the board is because you know Chase would not move forward with the project and they were, you know, they needed to get the confirmations both from Hampshire Mall as well as from the DOT that there was enough room to make the project work. And you might remember even when we started this project, we we originally, I mean, Mr. Dwyer definitely saw it. Like we we had a completely different layout um, when Chase first looked at this project. And then because of the, the takenings and everything, they made adjustments to ensure that the setbacks work. Well, I've appreciated Tom Quinlan's cautiousness over the years since I've been on the board, and I'm inclined to follow his lead if he thinks there is the potential, even though a minor potential, for uh, putting the town at risk. Yeah, so I think if, if the language is going to state that if there is a future taking from the Mass DOT, the applicant would have to go back in front of the necessary boards. I think we're we're comfortable with that, and I think what we're what we're asking, though, is that, you know, the there can be some assurances, I guess, for Chase, I guess, on the other side, that if, you know, we're waiting on Mass DOT to finish the sidewalk, per se, or some of their improvements, that the town will let Chase open. Um, you know, hopefully that's a, a fair way to look at it for both parties. Well, I guess if that's the case, and... Well, what does the board feel? We, we don't really have anything to approve here. It's more or less giving Mr. Quinlan the go ahead to uh, issue the billing permit, from what I understand. I'm, I'm hearing the question of, which isn't really to us, unless I'm misconstruing it, is 
to the inspection department is will they let them occupy if they haven't connected to the sidewalk? Oh. You know, is that, and I don't think that's our, that's probably Tom's discretion. Yes, Tom. Yeah, and that would just be a stipulation in the, you know, CO that it was going to be done with it. They could give us a certain amount of time. That's that's not a problem. That's, we want them open, so. Okay. Are, are you satisfied, Josh, with? <laughs> um, I think so. No, I, so I think, you know, for the board's record, we will provide a, a kind of a summary of kind of the minor changes to the plan just to make sure you guys have it on file. But it, And then Mr. Quinlan, I mean, happy to talk further, but it sounds like we've, we've, we're kind of aligned with, I think, you know, you're having the town's best interests in terms. And again, we totally agree. I mean, obviously if, if a, a new approval is created, you know, we would have to be required to get that. And I think it's good to hear that you're, you, you know, you want to push to have this building open as well. So we can kind of, um, I guess, work on as those stipulations are issued in the permit. Okay, I'll make a motion to accept the changes to the construction drawings with a request to provide an ongoing list of future changes. I would second that. Motion second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Good luck. All right. And next up was Mr. Phil. Oh, good evening. Um, I'm back with our um, separation of the Middle Street property, 215 Middle Street. And I believe Jim sent out the plans to all of you guys last week. Yes. I'm not, I'm not recalling it. Is that something that we can put up on the screen or? I think Jim sent it, David gave it to Jim. And then I think. It's a small subdivision, correct? No. It's just, it's an A&R plan. Oh, that's right. Okay, let me try it. Find it again. Send it on three twenty seven. So well, I have <clears throat> one question. Uh, is the right of way that's indicated going to the property to the rear of uh, the the lots? Is that right of way going to be adversely affected in any way, or is it going to just remain as is? Nothing at all changes with that, um, Joe. No changes, not a absolutely, absolutely no change there at all. Okay. You see the plan now? Whoop. No. No, I see email. No. 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 Yes. Might need to unshare, open the screen, and then reshare. I don't see the email unless it. Wait a minute. I'm going back to. That keeps going to that one. <clears throat> That's I've got it here. I can forward it on to everybody. That'd be great. Not sure why I didn't get it. I'm trying to restart my um, 
I sent it. Thank you, sir. Please stand by. We are experiencing technical difficulties. Get it? Not yet. It's caught in the. I did, and I think I I will try to bring it up. Okay, I have it up. So let me see what I can do here. I have to check my spam folder. There, can you see that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So everything is aligned, all right? Okay, wanna explain what you're doing here, Dave? Yeah, okay, so um, 215 Middle Street property currently includes parcel A and parcel B. Well, we wanted to take the parcel B square and attach it to the 209 Middle Street to the east and then parcel A that square would go to my son and daughter-in-law um, to the east, combine those as two parcels. Am I, am I explaining it correctly to you guys? So the yeah. back land goes to Richard and Maria Phil, of parcel A goes to them. Parcel B goes to the uh, other property that Joyce and I own, to make bigger lots. And then the 215 Middle Street with a weird shaped going out back um, has over 40,000 square feet. So we're in compliance. And the right of way off to the, to the left there could see a, a dotted line that's unaffected. Yep. We didn't go anywhere near that. Or the town's um, ditch right away and none of that. Any comments, questions? Looks supporting the Hoyle. I'll make a motion to approve the A signature of the ANR. We have a motion. Do you have a second? Second. Motion and second. Any comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Thanks. opposed? Oh well, let, let's do yeah. Um I can't participate, so I abstain. Okay, four dash o dash one four zero one. Motion passes. Okay, I got I got one question for you, Bill. Yep. On um, on the form A that I have to fill out for this, is it one for all the changes or one for each property as they will be? It'll be one for all of the changes because we're approving this plan. Okay, so one one form. Okay. And it will be the minimum fee for an ANR. Uh, which, what is that, like $19 or something? $25. $25. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. And um, when, you get your, when you get your Mylar, you'll uh, want to you get together with either me or Joe to sign it. We're both approved to sign um, these plans once they've been approved by the planning board. Okay. Um, I'm going to be back at your next meeting for the Isabel court. We got that one straightened out. Um, I just didn't get the information quick enough to Jim. I didn't give it to him until Monday. So um, unless you guys got it and you want to do it now. I didn't send it out yet. Okay. All right. So your next meeting, I can just come back and do that one as well. And then Bill, I'll just 
hunt either you or Joe down and have them all signed at once. Yeah. That'd be the use. Yep. Yep. That's okay. fine. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, David. All right. Good night. Now, we have a, a number of people here tonight. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and I've taken down names as you have logged in, but I'm thinking that many of you are here for one or the other of the public hearings that we have scheduled. Is there anyone who has a specific question for the planning board that is not related to any of the three public hearings we have on the agenda? Just raise your hand. If you raise your hand electronically, you will be sorted to the top of the, of the screen so that we will see you. And you raise your hand from the reactions button at the bo bottom of your uh, screen. Chris Anderson. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, I'm Chris Anderson with Hanging Engineering. Uh, we recently submitted a preliminary subdivision off of Breckenridge Road. Uh, we submitted the documents uh, digitally last Friday and dropped off hard copies yesterday. Uh, what we're looking for primarily from the board is the appropriate filing fee for the board or for the uh, subdivision. Um, it's a two lot subdivision. Uh, with a 260 foot long dead end road. Um, we're just looking to uh, finalize the committal with the town clerk, and the last step in the process would be the filing fee. Okay. The, uh, because we couldn't open the file and we couldn't view it in a timely manner, um, we're not ready to discuss your preliminary plan tonight. However, one of the questions I have is, from the plan that I'm looking at, I can't determine how many lots you have. How many, how many building lots is this subdivision creating? It's creating two lots. So if we were to look. So on the plans, we've denotated uh, lot number one, lot number two, um, as part of the um, actual preliminary plan itself. And in our narrative, we depict two lots as part of the uh, uh, submittal. Okay. Now, do you are are you trying to go for a full subdivision because you could qualify for a very small subdivision, and a lot of the requirements could be waived. And the town could never accept it as a town road if that's once if that's the way you would like to go, or do you want to make it a full subdivision? It's our intent to go with a minor road uh, subdivision um, to meet the requirements of the subdivision regulations. I don't know what a minor subdivision is. Uh, either, minor roadway designation. It's it's either a it's a it, it's what we call a. Uh, subdivision. It's a. It's a. Well, we don't call it a minor subdivision. We call it a subdivision where you don't go for the full fledged subdivision. Certain regulations or rules are waived. You know, like it doesn't have to be a paved road. Doesn't have to have all kinds of underground utilities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it never becomes a town way. It basically becomes a private way with two building lots on it. Let's, is that what you want, or do you want it to be a town road? Uh, at this point, we'd like it to be a town road. You want it to be a town road? Yeah. Okay, so you want the town people to be able to drive down this road? It would be a private road, but it would be uh, designed... There's no, such the thing as, there's no such thing as a private town road. It's either a, it's either a private road where subdivision rules are, some subdivision rules are waived, but if you go for the full subdivision approval, it becomes a town road and people can drive down the road. Can't be prevented. Yes. It's a public way. So if there's some confusion here, you are only the second subdivision that has been filed under the revised subdivision regulations that we adopted probably close to seven or eight years ago. 
So uh, I think there is a definition of minor road, uh, but it, it really, uh, what we have uh, a process called a very small subdivision where people ask to be excused from putting in a subdivision road. They want to uh, be uh, permitted to basically put in a common driveway but it will be uh, a way laid out by the planning board. So the second lot can have frontage or both lots can have frontage off the paper street. It just wouldn't be built to a street standard. Or be plowed by the town. Yeah. The town wouldn't accept it as a town road. It would be up to the owner of the two lots to have the road plowed and maintained. You would own all the utilities and underground, um, and therefore the road is private and people cannot drive down the road for the subdivision except visitors and people that you want to drive down the road. If it's a town road, then if it's anything else but this very small subdivision, then it must be accepted by the town. That's a stipulation of the subdivision rules, and anybody in Anybody literally can drive down this road and you can't stop them. And it has to be built to a much more strenuous. higher standard than a driveway. Right. You, in other words, if it's a very small subdivision, you need to be able to support the heavy town fire truck. You have to have a turnaround for a fire truck to turn around on, but it does not have to be paved. It can be maintained as a gravel road or a any kind of a TRG surface, or it can be paved if you want, but it doesn't have to be. It just has to be a good base that'll support the town heavy vehicles should the need arise. Jim, uh, also to we might add, or we, we have in the provision for a very small subdivision, a uh, dedicated open space. So uh, there has to be a certain amount of open space dedicated to Right. Which they can avoid by building it to the full subdivision standards. Right. right. But the uh, the gain the gain is going to be in the the price of the road. A full subdivision standard, I think, is what five hundred dollars a linear foot. Now, I, I'm just guessing. So you know, we're really well, that's, that's his decision. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. We'll be prepared to talk about this next at our next meeting. We just aren't right. prepared now. Most of us yep. didn't get a chance to see your plan. Yep, understood. Um, we would like to go for the full road subdivision. What they understand now, uh, yes, we have to meet okay. the requirements of the subdivision standards. Okay, that's your choice. <clears throat> okay. So is he going to send us the plan again so we can open it? The, well, he's there's paper copies in a town hall. Oh, yeah. All right, well, are you home, Mike, or are you still no, on? No. Right. Still on I sabbatical. Think, I think okay. we did get a, a P, uh, just a straight PDF on yeah. Monday, but I. Nope. Right. Not, I think the last file he sent around you could open. Okay, I'll look. If not, we'll go to the town hall. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Two weeks from tonight, Mr. Anderson, 630. All right. Thank you very much. Anybody else for that's not here for, for somebody's here for just in general information? Seeing none. Okay. I guess uh, first up is uh, Mr. Biano. Are you still here? Yep, I'm here. Here we go. Okay. All righty, great. So, uh, all right. So, I have some updates and everything like that um, for you guys. And um, so, where we're at with my landlord, I know I came uh, a couple meetings ago. I proposed to the planning board that. Um, there would be an opportunity for me to purchase the property. Uh, I finally heard back from my landlord on what the price was that they wanted for it. Uh, two or three days ago, 
two or three days ago. And um, I don't think at this time that we're really going to see eye to eye on the price with the with the landlord. I had an appraisal done, they had an appraisal done. And um, we're definitely both off by a lot. Um, however, what I am doing is I'm canceling my lease here. Um, where my lease is done in February of 2025. Uh, however, there's a stipulation on our contract and I can break it early. Um, but though I will be, I have acquired some land for my business and commercially zoned property elsewhere um, that I plan on um, moving all my equipment to. Um, so then we, we won't, um, uh, so we won't need to reside here as a business anymore. Um, what we are looking to do is um, right now we're, we're, pretty new in terms of, uh, of, of just acquiring the new piece of property. So we we're hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we can finish up on uh, just getting our approvals over there. Um, but though out of respect for the time for the, for the board and my, uh, and my neighbors, um, I was proposing that, um, you guys would be able to deny my site plan approval without me doing any appealing or anything like that. Um, but that would have till to July 1st to be able to move all of my, uh, my equipment out of here. Um, and then I also had some questions as well after that um, for my neighbors and for the uh, for the town, if I am able to broker a deal with the landlord to purchase the property, what their thoughts would be on having um, a multifamily housing unit here and what the potential um, of of that unit would would be for here. Multifamily housing is not does not permitted by the Hadley zoning bylaws. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few complicated emphasis on the complicated mm -hmm. ways around that and unless that was to come to fruition we would be we, we would spend an awful lot of time trying to explain that tonight so in a nutshell it's not permitted but there is like i said it, it's it's with some complicated efforts that could be possible but i'm not sure that you'd want to go through that for that small of a property yeah, no, it would be worth it for me. So that was pretty much. My I, I don't know that. I'm, I'm, I'm yep. making. I'm, I'm. I don't. I'm by no means a, a advising. <laughs> yes, yes. Yep. So I'm not saying that it wouldn't be, but um, the property is 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 kind of a small piece for something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I I don't know that. The the simplest thing you could do. We have two simple options. If you were owner occupant, you could have an accessory apartment there. And if the house existed in 1961, at the time of the adoption of the zoning bylaw, it could be converted to a two family mm -hmm. and potentially expanded somewhat. Um, but uh, that's that's it, no more than a two family. If you were gotcha. to put in, if you were, because your house is pre-existing, it was pre-existing in 1961, you could also convert it to senior housing. That's a possibility also. Um, but there's a lot of stipulations with that. You could, you could make that, I believe, up to a, I'm not sure if it's a three-family senior housing or whatever, but it has to be a rental property, I believe. I'm not positive. Gotcha. So, so I wouldn't be able to knock the building down and then build like a, like a condo unit or anything like that. Correct. That, that's gotcha. a correct statement. Yes. All right, great. Thank you for the information. That definitely definitely helps me make my decision. So I think for Mr. Viano, uh, he can withdraw his request, can he? And and then uh, we would stop these uh, every other month meetings. And he would not be allowed to... Uh, he he could he could withdraw his 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 uh, site plan approval, right? And he could he could apply at any time in the future again if he wanted to for a similar process, or somebody else could. But in the meantime, what if there are serious events that take place over the next three months? Uh, is that up to the building inspector to take care of? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So one thing we could do rather than close it out now, I mean, you could you could ask to withdraw your request now and we could vote to approve the withdrawal without prejudice. Or we can continue the hearing to uh, Tuesday, July 2nd. 
and you can withdraw at that point if you're if you're out. I mean, I don't think there's any point in our voting to deny your application. Um, There's no benefit to anyone. Yeah, I just don't see a point to it. But um, yeah, if there's some reason you think you want to have a denial, that would be we could work with you, I guess. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't see any benefit to a denial. But they'll also yeah, I'm just looking to kind of get everything pretty much out there in the open to be able to 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 essentially so we don't have to do meetings every month or anything like that just uh you know in favor of everybody's time right. and um on top of that as well i mean it is the beginning of the season for me so i mean all my equipment is is on the move all the time so we're pretty much oh, most of my stuff's out of here so so what do you think spring is going to be like for that site you said your equipment's elsewhere you you position equipment at, at other properties how do you do? Yep. So everything, uh, all my equipment goes out and is on site for the uh, for the for the year. Um, the only time things do come back here is is if something's broken or if um, or or a trailer. Um, but though, like my employees all meet on site. Uh, I only have two other employees, and one of them has a company truck, so he'll take his truck to the job site. And one of the other guys is lives right next door to the site that we're going to be on for a good amount of the time. So. I don't foresee having to have any really employees come here unless we're working on stuff on the shop here. Um, so that wouldn't be an everyday activity. Um, I also, all the job sites that we we're looking forward to for this year, um, don't require us to, to have to stage materials elsewhere. We can stage everything on site. So it would be very quiet. How are you with this, Paul? Um, that's fine. That's fine. Um, it, it sounds like he's, located another piece of property and he's moving the business out. Um, you know, I, I don't have any problem if, if obviously if he was going to stay, then, you know, um, the drainage system would be an issue, but, um, and uh, it would just nice be nice to see it um, put back to what it was prior to hasty fence, but, you know, that's up to the property owners um, if it was all graded nice and seated when he left, um, I don't have a problem with the runoff coming from the lawn onto into my catch basin, which is the way it was designed. And it is any isn't it wouldn't be any problem of any pollutants in that case, um, you know. And that that would be very agreeable to me. I don't know, if, you know, Rob and Stacia would be agreeable to that, but um, that's what I'd like to see happen. The fences uh very you know it's it's fallen down again and there's you know it's it's dangerous um i, I just assume that see the fence come down and just be returned back to lawn and graded and back the way it was and seed put on and then you don't have any issues with conservation and uh the runoff wouldn't be detrimental to my wetlands or the neighbor wetlands so um, that's what I'd like to see happen, but I guess that's up to Rob and Stacia Roy. Um, I can only make make that suggestion, but I think it would help increase the value of the property if they are thinking of selling it, because I think it's a real eyesore and it's it's detrimental the way it is now. The fence is down in several places, and it's it's dangerous if kids wander from my property on, to, on down into that bank in that area. So, but um, that's fine. You know, I don't have a problem. And, you know. Um, if you, if you see he's going to move out in July and the, the property gets cleaned up, I'm, I'm, that's fine. I, I don't have a problem with it. I don't, I don't think Lisa would have a problem with that either. She's not at the meeting, but I know she's had her concerns. So, um, that's my, my input. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Basically, you have, you have two choices. We could, um, you could request an extension to July 2nd, then come back and just, vote to withdraw or you could withdraw tonight kind of, and we could vote to approve whichever way you want to do it okay um yeah let's just withdraw tonight i think uh would make the most sense for us okay i'll make a motion to accept the withdrawal of the application at the applicant's request second motion second any other discussion hearing none all in favor aye aye 
Okay. Any Aye. Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Good luck, Mr. Bayano. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah. Okay. Next one up is Belize. I Jim, think... do, do you want to? I don't know if people are here for ours or the next one. I don't know if you want to take it out of. Oh. I mean, it's all been noticed for six forty-five, so I think it's fine. We're, no. I don't know if you want to take the next one because there might be public here. Yeah, there's probably like more for the uh, battery storage, is what I'm guessing. Battery storage one. That's what, and we're we're fine. We're fine waiting. Okay. Is this the official public hearing for police or just he's looking for opinions? Continue continuation of the public hearing. Okay. Um what we have is the zone bylaw. We don't have the one for right. We continued the uh battery storage. Site plan approval to uh, May seventh, right? May seventh. Okay, right. So this is the one. The next one is the uh, the zone the zone bylaw. I mean, let me. Could, could you show by a show of hands if people are here for the zone bylaw or for the battery storage? You electronically just raise your hand, please, if you're here for the battery storage. Okay, that has been continued to May seventh at six forty-five. That will not even, be taken. It's even further. It's uh, continued to uh, June fourth. June fourth. Yes. Okay, June. I'm sorry, June fourth. That's continued to June fourth at six forty-five. That's the Breckenridge road. That's the application. That's, that's the one off of Breckenridge. That's correct. Not the, but yeah, the energy storage. Yes. DP battery for the energy storage off Breckenridge has con is continued. That's right. Because somebody can't make the May 7th meeting. June 4th. Yeah. So June 4th. Anybody here for the zone bylaw on energy storage? John, did you have a separate question? Sean Mackin? Hi everybody. No, I I would just wanted to listen to the zone bylaw. Okay. Because at, two weeks ago, it was discussed and it was said that it was going to be further discussed Tonight. this year. So is that correct or should, is that no? The the the, the the bylaw, the energy storage bylaw will be discussed tonight. All right. Thank you, Jim. Anybody else here for the for the zone bylaw on energy storage? Okay. Everybody else is just here for general information or just, just curiosity? Or police. Or police. Anybody here for police besides Mr. Reedy? Well, we got a lot of people just curious curiosity tonight. Sean Mack and your hand is still up. If you go in, okay. Your... Well, oh, there you go. Um, so let's do the energy storage bylaw public hearing continuation. Okay. When we left the last public hearing, the uh, we were discuss we the energy storage just to review it. Energy storage basically is going to it's a battery storage would be permitted in all agricult residential agricultural areas and industrial areas in the town of Hadley. And we were discussing excluding it from the aquifer protection districts, which comprises roughly a good half, if not more than the town of Hadley. Um, the I've added a couple of things to this energy storage bylaw. One is that the fire chief has requested that a fire hydrant be within 300 feet of the actual storage uh, compartments, if you would, um, because they obviously need heavy duty fire 
protection if a fire was to ever occur. So 300 feet, typically the uh, subdivision regs require a fire hydrant every 500 feet. And at first the fire fire chiefs said 500 feet, but then I said, well, the, the, the spacing of fire hydrants is 500 feet. So let's make 300 foot distance from a hydrant to the actual um, containers. And he's, that way he's fine with that. So, and I also put down that the spill containments, this is something we could be discussing is there, the spill containment is required around all hazardous, around all con anything that has a liquid con uh, in it, and it should, shall contain 110, with, withhold, or hold rather, not withhold, hold 110% of the rated capacity of any containers, any and all containers. And I've added a little bit to that that we can discuss in that the spill containment shall be fire resistant and fire proof to 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. And the reason for the 2300 degrees is because the melting point of steel is roughly 25 to 2700. The melting point of concrete is excessive close to 3000. So 2300 seems to be a reasonable number to be fire resistant and fire proof. I don't know if we wanna use that um, language or not? Well, some language, Jim, should be put in there to verify the safety of the enclosure in some way, shape, or form, whether it's a general or whether it's specific, but that can be discussed. Okay. Yep. I was going to just say fire resistant and fire fireproof, but that's kind of uh, what does that mean? Fire resistant to what? 400 degrees, 300 degrees. So 2300 seems to be a relatively high number. Now fires can get hotter than that. I don't disagree. However, there is no such thing as fireproof in all honesty. And same thing okay. with fire resistant. How, how do you protect against explosions and the noxious gases that will naturally develop if this thing explodes? There is nothing that will protect against an explosion. Except not having it there, right? That is correct. Yeah. Um, noxious, I mean, gases, well, I, I don't think that's possible either, except like you said, not having it. You can yeah. typically, you know, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, you're, you're, you're speaking way beyond my expertise on those two. Well, I just read about the gases that are generated when these things catch on fire and explode and they generally settle near the earth because they're heavier than air and uh, they can cause serious uh, health problems to your lungs, lungs and the lungs, lungs and skin and everything else and they, they can kill you. I mean, I mean that, that's one of the things, that's one of the reasons where we are re re discussing yeah not to have it in the aquifer district. Like, yeah. I, I think, Jim, you, we're beginning to hone in on what we really want to have done, not in the aquifer protection district, in the other districts, as you've mentioned, and because we're on the horns of a dilemma. If all of a sudden we say it's not allowed anywhere, like it was in uh, some other towns, then, of course, the attorney general is going to reject it. So if we, however... I think there's good justification for not allowing it in the aquifer of protection. You know, if it does leak or it does uh, affect the water supply, uh, it's for our safety and health of the citizens. So I think as far as the zones, zones are concerned, you're, you brought up the points that we, we talked about the last meeting and the fact that some, some paragraph should be put in there that it has to be in some way confined to that particular area, whether it be weld or... But the other thing that amazes me is the fact that when, I think, Jim, you asked the, uh, the applicant uh, if there's any other towns that had it, and he lists the towns, and one of them was Hadley, Massachusetts. Now, 
the battery storage system that is located in Hadley, Massachusetts is on the University of Massachusetts property, right adjacent to their power plant. And does that mean they have a get out of jail free card? They can do anything they want in town, even before we pass the bylaw. So that is probably, what do you think, Bill? Is that yeah, they, they, they have a get out of jail free card. They can do only exemption. They, okay. For, so. for their official uses. Okay, so we're we're not going to even argue that then. But uh, and, and and also, it, it's probably not. A, I don't know how big the the capacity of that storage is, but it may not be in the five megawatt range either. It's pretty big, Jim. I drove what by, it? and it's pretty very similar to the photograph that we were shown. It had looked like eight refrigerators stacked up side by side. It fenced okay. in. All no, right. So. Okay. Now, just for our information and everybody else here, we need to make a decision tonight as to which article goes on the town warrant because the deadline for submission is April 17th for the town warrant. So we can amend it on the town meeting floor if we so choose. However, that's highly not recommended. But we need to make a decision tonight on which article goes to the uh, town administrator for publishing in the warrant. Just so we'll all know that. We so the the uh, the one that we were proposing or you were proposing well, at really the last, can't. Uh, okay. negative in the aqua protection district, uh, but in all the other districts that you mentioned. That's correct. I yes. think that's an effective compromise and that doesn't leave us exposed to the state overruling us for not having any districts. But, yeah. How close to a residential home can, home can these things be? I mean, in the backyard, like a solar array? I don't well, know. We already have them affiliated with solar arrays yeah. yeah yeah we have we have one battery storage with a with a solar array um to the rear of hampshire mall but that is not in the aquifer no uh let me see oh yeah i would go with Let's, let's see if we can eat, get it pa get it through town meeting even outside of the aquifer. I'm I'm thinking that this is maybe not going to be uh, anywhere close to a two thirds vote, but we'll see. But I'd say exclude uh, from the aquifer, mm -hmm. and um, I may just take want to take a another look at the wording. Is one thing I'm. Concerned about is sometimes the attorney general will disapprove a bylaw, or sometimes they will just disapprove a portion of a bylaw. So they could approve our bylaw in all respects except deleting the sentence that says, except in the aquifer protection district. So I want to um I want to just take a look at how that's worded. Um, could, could we could we put any commentary in one or two sentences talking about the importance of the aquifer protection could, area? Not it doesn't have to be part of the zoning bylaw. We can provide a commentary to the attorney general. Right. With the, we can we don't usually do it, but we can have a um, uh, uh, an essay accompanying the bylaw explaining why we're doing what it with the way we're doing it it might be good to have a certified geologist prepare that essay but the uh, the negative approval by the attorney general in the geez i can't recall the the term wendell 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 uh, wendell uh health and safety was one of the reasons uh, they said that it could be uh, not included. So health and safety, 
certainly qualifies in the Aqua Protection District. So, but okay. Wendell's Wendell's attempt to legislate against batteries was rejected. That's because it went to it was went to a town meeting after, and it wouldn't didn't have the necessary hearing time. It was a complicated issue, uh, but I. Okay. But I think, yeah, we have a, a Mike, we have a, a decent grounds to say you know, we we lost one of our wells for how many years because of the uh rocket fuel yeah chlorate for chlorate was the chlorate. Yeah. chlorate trace elements so uh okay uh yeah we'd want to mention that Okay. So lithium batteries, when they undergo a process called thermal runaway, can indeed explode and cause significant destruction. To train chain reaction within the battery that generates excessive heat and if not managed properly can lead to an explosion. And it goes on and on. Kind of like what, what almost happened at Three Mile Island or did happen at Chernobyl. Well, I think that is a little so, inflammatory. So inflammatory. We'll okay. up at the town meeting if you want to present it. And if people don't want it, they just vote against it. So yeah, uh, we we kind of have a responsibility to permit to get something before the town meeting, and this seems like a pretty effective compromise. I agree. I agree, okay. Jim. When did you say the um, we April, have to get April seventeenth? April seventeenth. Okay. So. Let's continue this to our meeting on the 16th, just so I can take a, se a second look at the at the uh, the wording. I'm looking at March. Okay, you're right, April 16th, yes, okay. All right, that's yeah. fine, okay. I'm looking at the March calendar, not April, you're right. 16th is the third Tuesday. Thir yeah, second, yeah, one, two, three, third Tuesday, yeah, right, so we have one day. Ex excellent idea, Bill, so, yeah. Any comments from anybody in the audience on this? Audra? Is your hand up for this? Audra Knightley? You're muted. Sorry, I was trying to come off mute. I, I live right across the street from where this is being proposed. And wouldn't this, if there was an explosion potentially take my house out and the neighbor's house around us. And aren't we protected because there's a water source? We're, at we're the bottom? not discussing it. We're, I don't mean to shut you off, but we're not discussing that particular item tonight. Okay. okay. That's not on the agenda. We can't, we really, you're also asking a question that we have no idea about. Okay. We well, were talking about explosions earlier and bad air and all those other things. So, just have those questions and those concerns. So do we as the neighborhood need to show up at the town meeting in April to vote on this? You, this is the zone bylaw that would permit energy storage. The, Got it. The town meeting, annual town meeting is May 2nd at I think seven o'clock. And so if you are in favor of this bylaw, Yes, you should come to that meet. You should come to that meeting if you're in favor or against this bylaw and vote one way or the other. Okay, thank and, you. And 
But we should also just I, say, I think what you were interested in speaking to was the project across the street, and that is not correct on the table tonight. We're just talking about our battery storage in the town of Hadley. In general, and where it Got should, it. shouldn't be. Yes. Right. And, and how to hit that bylaw so you can't be overridden. Got it. And, and that project that you were uh, referring to is, yeah. uh, what's that, June? Yeah. Now, now, just so people will understand this, they probably weren't at the last meeting. This, the current um, solar bylaw does not permit battery storage, energy storage in the town of Hadley, unless it's associated with a solar field. So a standalone project um, cannot be installed. However, the attorney general has determined at their opinion that that is not a legal thing to do and you must allow battery storage. So this bylaw is being proposed as a way to regulate standalone battery storage systems within the town. If this were to fail, there is a chance the attorney general could say, put it anywhere you want, and if we don't have a bylaw, it could be done without control. So we're trying to put controls in. On controls around it. Got it. Okay. We're trying Makes to sense. Them so it's not like we're, you, as, you, as you can tell, the planning board doesn't like what we're proposing in general, but we don't think we have a choice. Got it. And Halley Town Council was of the opinion that the current bylaw does not allow standalone systems. Right. We got that opinion several months back. Correct. Several years back. Several, several years, years back. Several months as well. Probably two. Time flies when you're getting older. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tony Fighten. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to uh, kind of re reiterate a few things that I said last week and then make raise a new point. First of all, Mr. Maximowski. That is not correct that the attorney general said that we must allow. Just, just for the record, that's not what the statement, that's not what the opinion says. It says we can we we can ban it if it's for health, safety, or welfare. That's that's in their statement. It does not say we must allow. So I fundamentally disagree with the board's stance. And I um that we're taking something. I don't see a lot of enthusiasm for this on this board. And yet you're going to put it in front of town meeting and give people, a lot of people at town meeting, that's the first they're going to see of this. They put a lot of stock into your opinions. The planning board says it's okay. It must be okay. That's not the way we should be doing things. And again, that's not what the attorney general said. We do not have to allow this. The, um, the second part I want to raise, and this is very important. This came out yesterday. I want to make sure that you're all aware of this is that the Commission on Energy Infrastructure Siting and Permitting came out with their report um, at the um, urging of the governor. It was the governor's panel that convened this panel. That commission stated that they're going to try to uh, streamline permitting for all types of projects like this, solar, wind, storage. They're gonna to try to get it done within 15 months. They're going to try to force this on us. They're going to say they're going to have one permit and that we're, there's going to be a, a little public comment period and then it's going to go through. This is because based on what they what they put into the law, this, um, uh, these unrealistic uh, carbon standards, there's no way they can meet this without forcing all this uh, down our throats. Even if they do, it's not going to work. Let's just make that clear. There's no possible way they're going to get to where they're going to, they say they're going to go. But they're going to try to force this on us. And I just want to make clear, there's 15 months, one permit, we're being steamrolled. They're coming after the farmland. They're coming after the forest. They're coming after everything they get. Because if you look at Massachusetts, we don't have a lot of open land. And Hadley happens to be one of the, we do have a lot of open land. It's called farms. If you think that we're going to, these dual use, that's a joke. There's no dual use unless you want to have chickens scratching underneath those, those panels. That's not dual use. That's just no, uh, no farming. So in light of this commission coming out with this report just yesterday, 
until why should we um let me let me put this another way they're trying to steamroll us why should we try to get ahead of the steamroller why don't we say why don't we try to stop the steamroll so no i disagree with this that we have to put something in front of town meeting that's not what the attorney general says it's not the right thing to do and we're and this could end up passing something that you that this board admits is bad so um i'll leave it there thank you thank you Sean Mackin. Um, I want to thank you guys for paying attention to this because as a neighbor, I have a hard time accepting that I'm going to get an energy storage system that doesn't meet our bylaws on right next to a farm, a residential area, and a kid's playground. I have a hard time thinking that this would ever go through, but I'm here again and I was here two weeks ago because this is important to me, just as I'm sure it's important to you. So to kind of echo Tony's point, we I didn't grow up in Hadley. I grew up in Pennsylvania and Hadley, everyone knows Hadley is known for its farming, the asparagus capital of the world and everything great that's here. And this is why we raised our kids here. And now I got to face the situation where we're going to try to appease other people as opposed to standing up for what we believe is right. And you, you, all of you know this area and love this area more than I do. And sometimes we have to stand up for what we believe. And if it takes a fight, then we have to stand up and prepare to fight because I will. I, I, I'm here because I think that we have to stand up for what's right. We have a, we have a bylaw. And there's a reason why that's done. And there are other towns in Massachusetts where they could put energy storage systems that would comply with their law. But I, I would really not want Hadley to be one of them. So uh, again, uh, I, I would ask that you <clears throat> think about this because it's uh, this is extremely important to me and my family and, and our neighbors as well. Um, and, and thank you very much for your time. I appreciate all your hard work. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Anything else on the board on this one? Well, I would just say in response to one thing that Mr. Mackin said, I don't think we're going to get away with saying not in our town. I think what we're trying to do is find where's the safest place. Is there, I mean, maybe there isn't a safe place, but that's what I think we're trying to, I mean, when, when this first came up, I said, why don't we just limit it to the industrial uh, district? Um, now that could blow up in our face too, because we approved a by right storage building in an, and industrial and we got lambasted in the paper and that's another thing we're not going to make everyone happy but i am in support of uh battery storage but i you know like anyone else i don't want it in my backyard i don't want it in your backyard so i'm pro you know let's put it in an industrial zone but i'm i'm, I'm not thinking that we want to get everyone fired up to say not in our town because if because then every other town, everyone loves their kids. And if everyone says not in our town, that's not viable. And like you said, th then it comes back at us. The, the only problem with just the industrial district is the industrial, usable industrial district in town that's not in the aquifer is mm -hmm. tiny at best. And then when the, when the attorney general looked at what were the area that we're allowing it in, then they may not appreciate that much. I That's wonder. If, I, I don't disagree that, with your comment on that one, but yeah, it's just yeah. such a small area. I wonder if we could say then, then if it is allowed in the AR district, then maybe it's not within... 500 or 1,000 feet of an existing residence. And then someone in the future can choose to build or not build within that radius. But That's a good point, Mark.
So I'll make a motion to continue the uh, public hearing to April 16th. Second. Motion second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Attorney Reedy, finally. Show time. Um, let me, if I could, share my screen and I can kind of walk you through uh, the site and our presentation. Yeah, you're set. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Uh, for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of Belize SLS uh, and its application for site plan review for uh, auto dealership as well as business use in the aquifer and potentially and likely transfer of development rights. Uh, with me this evening uh, from Belize, we've got their director of facilities, uh, Jeff Casey, and also Alex Belize. And then we've got Steve Cabral from Crossman Engineering, who's the site designer, and, and he'll be able to talk about any site questions you have, um, stormwater, et cetera. Um, so, and the board's very familiar with this area, 305 Russell Street, if you can follow my mouse, 315 Russell Street, the, the site of the Steve Lewis Subaru, the former Steve Lewis Subaru. And then 303 Rear Russell Street it was a building Barry Roberts built for um, Jeff Waskevich and Reos that I was in front of you. I want to say it was February or March of last year to get this approved uh, for a auto service, et cetera, use this. There's a perimeter plan. I, I think Randy has been in front of you for a, a perimeter plan combining these three parcels. Um, but these are all one at this point. So 305, 315, and 303 will likely just be called 315 uh, at this point. And so you've got obviously existing conditions. If you've been by, if you've been to the site, you know what you're dealing with. Uh, existing structure, which I'll get into a little bit. Uh, it's about 16,000 square feet and some change. You've got uh, display, 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 parking, and then you've got uh, the other kind of showroom, service, et cetera. Um, north is to the left, east is to the top, west is you know this way uh, to the bottom of the page, and then south is to the right of the page. So I'll just scroll up so you can see what the proposed layout would be. Um, it's going to pull the building back. The building right now, as we'll show, is about you know 63 feet to the property line and its nearest point. This is 177 feet to the property line. It's it's over 190 feet to actually where the traveled way is. Uh, entrance is staying is essentially the same area. Um, I'll show in a call out in a later slide, but you may recall that we had I had brought when we when I originally submitted this um, a plan showing us. I think it was 25 feet off of the roadway. We've pulled that back to 40 feet. And it was through the discussion of splitting the difference. You'll see that the 50 foot line is in the middle of where these spaces are. Um, and I think the conversation was, well, let's not eat up that whole space. And I think this was with the board. Let's uh, allow you to have that space, but pull it off the road and, and keep it elevated. Um, these are display spaces. These are display spaces. These are display spaces. And then we've got um, customer parking spaces, customer parking spaces, customer parking spaces. The building itself is a, about 32,000 square feet. Um, I'll show a slide later. I'll, I'll get into the detail a little bit more, but also display spaces, display spaces. And then this is that auto service, detailing, storage, car wash, et cetera, over there that was approved. Um, entrance and exit, still full access curb cut off of Route 9, and then site circulation. You know, you come in here, you've got the arrow showing you which way to go. You know, you, if you want to pull into the parking space and go into the showroom, you can. But if you're going to service, if, if you've seen or been to any of the newer dealerships, you know, you pull the vehicle up, you've got the doors that open, you pull your vehicle in, you know, turn your vehicle off, and then you go to the check-in desk. That would be right here, and then you leave your vehicle in, in the Folks at the dealership will take your vehicle into the area back here, which are the, the service bays. Um, I'll 
scan down here just to show right now this existing building, like I said, 63 feet at its nearest point, 15 feet from the side yard property line, 15 feet from this rear yard property line. And so it's a pre-existing non-conforming building structure. Uh, we were in front of, I was in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals last Thursday evening. We received a finding uh, that we can put this new building, which will from the property line be no closer than 20 feet. So it's it's getting better. 40 feet is what's required in the industrial zoning district. Um, so we're making it better, but we're not totally complying with, with what's required. It really is like just this small little area that's within that 40 feet as compared to what you saw in that last slide. Uh, and so we got the finding from the Zoning Board of Appeals that it's not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than what uh, is existing. So this building can be cited the way that it's being proposed to be cited. As I said, 177 feet to its nearest point uh, to the uh, property line. And I think it's another 20 or so feet to the traveled way. Um, 40 feet back uh, where those first display vehicles would be. And if you follow this hashed line, you'll see that that's the 50 foot setback. So you've got half of the vehicles would be within that front yard setback. You've got a provision which is waivable and we're asking for that waiver to allow us to, to park, to have these vehicles in the front yard setback. Uh, again, vehicle storage at the rear. Um, and I think what I'll do is I will zoom in a little bit to the building. And so you'll see you know, you've got the service drive here, double bay. Uh, you've got a waiting area, sales area, showroom area, reception, another showroom, uh, delivery, parts delivery, uh, conference room, uh, mezzanine above, about a 1,400 square foot mezzanine above, electrical, uh, banks, Fluid. So all the fluids are inside. They're uh, above ground. Um, and so, you know, you're going to deal with um, new and used motor oil, transmission fluid, washer fluid, et cetera. But that's all in here. And what they are is they're they're piped uh, through different lines into the service area in here. Uh, so everything's inside. Knowing that we're in the aquifer, everything's inside uh, in containment. Um, again, you've got inventory here in the back, and then you've got site circulation around the entirety of the building, you know, 24 feet on one side. You know, it narrows down here to, to 12 feet and then opens back up. Um, one of the things, and I think we had talked about this last year, we talked about really this cut through and, and that hasn't changed, right? There's still this access and cut through between these two properties. Um, has the fire chief looked at the access? I don't know. I don't know if the board had sent it along. We're happy to have a conversation with him, obviously. How many cars are there on the old uh Subaru site are there and how many will be there after this reconfiguration? Yeah, great, great question, Mike. Um, I, I took a quick look and there's there's 159 parking spaces right here. Uh, there's 30 parking spaces right here. There's, well, not parking spaces, 11 cars of storage. So that's 18, uh, 189 and 11 cars for storage here. You know, one of the other things when I'm looking at the aerial, there are some additional vehicles right here as well, right? And I, you know, I did two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32. Let's say another 34 on top of that. So 189, 90, 200, 234 of display. And then you've got, you know, some parking. Uh, right here. And then I think five parking spaces there. In the future conditions, I think I've got 162 display on the ground display spaces and 25 uh, parking spaces, you know, so display, 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 display. 
and then parking, parking, parking. So you've got um, almost less display spaces yeah. uh, on the ground display spaces, but also, I mean, just a really superior building. Um, something that Subaru is going to, I mean, they're requiring this. I think that's why you're seeing, you know, the Belize family coming into town is because they're the ones who can actually perform something like this, uh, where the previous owner might not have been able to. And we stop there and just see what the grading, what is that front display space elevation compared yeah. to the road? And I think it might be better. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's the let me see. And Steve Cabral, if you if you know the sheet that's gonna have that, this probably is the one right here, oh. right? Oh uh, yes. Yes, this is the one. Okay. Um proposed grading, All right? Sure. So you've got you know, up here, you know, 142, 141 at the street. Um, and then you're up to, you know, 144, 146, 147 here, you know, 147 here, 146 here, 145 here. So you've got, you know, a good, looks like probably four, four feet aerial separation between where the traveled way is, if not more. And Steve, if you know more about it, by all means, jump in. But that's what you know, um, bottom yes. of the blacktop at 144.8. Why don't yes, you make a, a comment, Mr. Reedy? You're, you're really good at reading blueprints. <laughs> 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 a lot of attorneys can't make heads or tails out of them. <laughs> you have to. I mean, you, you guys see a lot of them, too. Yeah. So, yeah, so you've got that vertical separation uh, Mark from the street, which you know, so it's not only set back forty feet compared to what you're dealing with now. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, Joe, hopefully, will be pleased that you know, I think it's really in this area where there's been some parking, and I've been here a couple of times, and and each time Joe's brought it up about the parking that's existing there. You know, with approval of this project, uh, that goes away, and it, it, everything's cleaned up. Right. I think you've got a retaining wall shown here, modular block retaining wall to hold the site up, which I think helps clean it up a little bit. And then you've got your display at least 40 feet back off of the property line, let alone, you know, 50 plus, I would assume, off the traveled way. Um, and then there's also that vertical separation. So, you know, sight lines are, are pretty clear. Um, and you know that the folks that are up here aren't about to pull out onto the uh, roadway like maybe some other uses in town and other spots in town. Thank you for pulling them back 40 feet. Sure. We think it made sense. So obviously we're happy to work with the board. Um, oh, and if I may, Tom, you did such a great job. I didn't feel as though I needed to butt in on your your grading discussion. But, but one thing I will add is that even though the parking is approximately three to four feet above uh, the roadway, we are going to slightly flatten the entrance drive to make it much easier for the delivery vehicles to actually pull in. So there is a benefit. We have the visual separation, plus we have an easier transition for, for the delivery vehicles to enter and exit. Hmm. Excellent. We don't try um, for that one. <laughs> You know, Steve, maybe while you've got the microphone, uh, if you want to talk through the the drainage plan and just the overall concept. I mean, we've obviously, you know, before you do that, we, we sent the plan off to Berkshire Design. They sent their comments back, I think, March 21st. I would consider it a, a clean letter. They had a couple of comments, one about the pre-existing nonconformity, which the ZBA uh, resolved, one about the parking, which we'll talk about a little later uh, this evening, um, and then just a couple of what I would call like dinks and dunks, you know, show this detail, show the size of that sign, um, fine with the traffic uh, study, et cetera, um, and fine with the stormwater. So I would consider it a clean letter from them. And Steve, if you want to address any of those comments they made or just hop into the stormwater, that's fine. Oh, sure. I mean, all of their their miscellaneous suggestions we easily accommodate. For example, on some sheets, we have the names and the names of the abutters. They just requested that we also added onto the radius map. And then we had a series of stop signs and directional signage, and they had asked that we add the size of the signs, which, which of course, is standard. In regards to drainage, 
Oh, I, and I do agree with Attorney Reedy that they essentially agree that the drainage design conforms to the state and local standards. But in, in general, when we first were introduced to this site and the project, uh, the first thing that was done was a full you know, topographic boundary and a wetland survey of the site. And one of the reasons we needed to have a detailed survey of the site is we wanted to make sure we could identify the direction of all stormwater runoff today you know, how does the existing conditions impact the abutters? Because as we approached the design, we wanted to make sure that if anything, we wanted to be able to say more than say that there's no impact. We wanted to say that there actually would be an improvement. And with the Belize's um, support, you know, based on the aerial images that Attorney Reedy showed, you could see that there's a significantly more uh, open space or landscaping space than compared to existing conditions. And in regards to the stormwater, before we actually designed the stormwater system, we performed a series of soil evaluations throughout the site. And this site is rather unique. I mean, after performing stormwater and soil evaluations for 40 years, this is the first site where we found, a we consider it to be a rather unique soil. It was very highly silty, very fine, and it essentially had no ability to infiltrate stormwater runoff. And as we looked at historical design plans of past additions to the site, we found that those engineers came to that same conclusion. So the existing drainage system for the existing dealership essentially has a series of catch basins that discharge into a subsurface detention system. And that subsurface detention system is connected to an 18 inch drain at the rear of the property. Now, based upon the conditions that we found, we came up with a similar design, but much larger. The reason we couldn't utilize their existing system is that based upon the placement of the building, their existing stormwater detention system is going to be impacted by the building foundation. So our design, has a series of catch basins and manholes throughout the site. So all one off from the Subaru area will be collected in pipe to the rear of the property. And prior to entering the subsurface detention system will go through a, a storm scepter, which is an allowed um, a swirl chamber that has the ability to, to remove up to 80% of the total suspended solid, so that with the combination of the deep sump catch basins and the storm scepter, we conform to the DEP you know, water quality standards. Then all of the runoff discharges into that blue area represents a large bed of solid underground piping that's connected by manifolds on both sides. Now, there is no infiltration that's proposed as I said, mainly because of the poor soil conditions. But we are treating the water quality. The runoff will be detained. And then the last outlet manhole has a series of wear structures so that we can control the outlet and the peak flow rates that ultimately connect into that same existing 18 inch pipe that runs along the rear of the property and flows to the, to the west. Now, as we performed the design, we analyzed all of the rain events from a one inch storm up to the hundred year storm. So basically we looked at the one inch, the two year storm, which has precipitation of approximately three inches in a 24 hour period. We also analyzed the 10 year rainfall event that has 4.88 inches in a 24 hour period. And we analyzed the 100-year rain event, which has approximately 7.8 inches of rainfall in a 24-hour period. And as we modeled each of those rain events, the system that we've, we're proposing has a decrease in peak flow rates to all of the adjacent properties and a decrease to the existing 18-inch drain line. So this was one of those projects where we were able to fully we, we can we can state that there will be no impact and that there'll be a slight benefit because we are decreasing the runoff to all of the abutters and we even have a slight decrease to that existing 18 inch drain line. 
And as I stated, any impervious area that we've created, we're also treating the runoff to can fully conform to the water quality standards. So that's the drainage in a nutshell. I heard about the separator for the solids. Is that uh, is that an oil water separator as well? It it does have the ability. Yes, there is a. It it does have baffles, so it does have the ability to you know address any floatables. The, the land is silty, the soil is silty because it was the bottom of the historically, geologically historic Lake Hitchcock. Yeah, I believe it. Glacial till. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, this... That's deep. So the, the, the 18 inch, where is that runoff and where does that discharge? We'll okay, if we go to the existing conditions plan, it shows it best. Yeah, uh, Tom, if you could zoom in. I want to zoom but, in a little bit here. Yeah, basically, the 18 inch runs from east to west. It runs parallel to the land in the back, and it discharges at the very lowest corner of the property into the existing wetland. Right. right down here, Mark. Yeah, and that's exist. I mean, you can go out there and see it. It's a, I mean, big old uh, pipe that's been there for a good amount of time. Okay. So that daylight's on the property or just off? Yeah. And within the property. Yeah. 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 yeah if we really zoomed in at that point, you'd yeah. see that the You've got a rip the surveyor I found the surveyor did find the end of the pipe. Okay. Yes, right there. Well, now, who did the peer review? Was Berkshire that... Design. Berkshire. Okay. Yeah, and they were they were good with it all. Okay. Um, okay. Grading drainage. Oh, and I could quickly hit on lighting. We are proposing dark sky compliant lighting throughout the site, and the poles are no more than 15 feet tall. And we've made sure that there's no light shedding onto the abutting properties. Yeah. So you've got here. Yes. Yeah, though the circular lines represent the foot candle spreads. And as I mentioned, they're based on a 15 foot tall uh, fixture. Is that, um, do you have like a tiered, um, you know, that after certain hours, those lights turn down to just like security level? Like, you know, maybe you bring them on bright at first while people are out driving around so they can see your beautiful cars. And then after a certain hour, it steps down or? They, yes, they, they do have the ability of being on a timer and a sensor. <laughs> So that in the evening time, the lights have the ability of dimming so that they're more security lighting. Okay. Steve, I don't know if you want to touch on, I think landscaping's next while you're up and on a roll. Oh, sure. Ba basically, the main focus of the landscaping was to, you know, provide additional, to provide a mixture of trees and shrubs and ground cover along the frontage and the immediate sides, but we didn't want to have such a dense landscape buffer in the front that it would negate the visual of the, the new vehicles. But basically our landscape architect, in the front she has a mix of hydrangea, wheatgrass, daylilies, ginkgo trees, and you know, daylilies, she likes to have an assortment of vegetation that is can be maintained and it fits into the area. Some of the islands in the parking area has a mix of inkberries and rhododendra. So she likes to have a mix of colorful ornamental shrubs and flowers. Now, as we go towards the rear, the spacing between the pavement and the property lines are limited. So it's mostly 
lawns, the, the few trees in the, in the rear, which are, I believe they're Zelkova. Oh, no, I'm sorry, those trees happen to be uh, small red maples. Yep. Now, if the, the board desires, you could certainly add additional landscaping. But in areas where the space was tight, she knows it's best not to have large trees that could grow with their roots eventually growing into the pavement. But if the board did prefer, she could certainly add more more shrubs along the eastern property line. Um, have you, uh, I know a lot of it's going to be covered with vehicles. Do you have snow storage area for the areas that are not covered by? The snow storage areas would be primarily along the areas that where we don't show the shrubs in the very rear of the property. You know, what, what we could do is when we submit the plan with the details of the signs that Berkshire requested, we could identify specific snow storage stockpile areas to make it clearer for everyone. We just got some planting details and this is as i had alluded to earlier a floor plan of the um, proposed dealership oriented a little bit different so you've got east is is down north is right west is up and then south is left so vehicles in your mind's eye if you could see them coming in off route nine which is going to be over on this side of the page would come in if they're going to get service come in, door opens, they pull in, they go here. Then an employee would come and take the vehicle, bring it in to one of the service bays. You know, there's express service bays, EV service bays. They've got the central tools in here, but they have, you know, all of these different service bays for different um, uses. And then state inspection here in the corner, um, restrooms, break room, waiting area, and then the sales floor with then sales representatives. And I, I suggest, you know, um, different offices, whether it's the general manager, um, title, insurance, uh, op an office space, delivery of you know, new vehicles here. And then you've got the parts in here. And then this is where we were talking about the, the indoor um, fluid storage is right over here uh, out of the way. So you're not, having vehicles you know they're not stored out here in the middle where you've got a vehicle coming in and, and potentially hitting it so that's the floor plan um pretty refined floor plan and then we've got the um elevations of what the the site would look like and and we'll talk about the the signage in a bit and also just parking i think those are probably the last two as far as as we're concerned, um, and this this shows the signage as was, and we'll just jump into it now. This one shows the signage as was proposed, and I think it's in total, including service, this sign, this Subaru, and this Belize. I think we're at one hundred and forty eight point two nine or so square feet. Um, Mr. Dreyer was at the uh, ZBA hearing last Thursday. Expressed the planning board's disapproval of this. Package did suggest, though, that service could be considered a directional sign. And so in working with, and I'll stop the share and I'll bring up a, a new plan, which, um, as you can appreciate, a lot of this is, is dictated by um, Subaru of America, Subaru New England. Please don't say that. Uh, uh. Well, and that's why we've gone back and pushed back. To, to try to get something that is is more amenable I think to everybody and I'll and I'll just talk through it a little bit um and so you know the, the service sign is staying the same so excluding that what we're looking at here and when you look at the building you know, we, we like to be architecturally proportionate and so this sign here is being reduced from what it was to 33 square feet uh the Subaru here is they're 30 inch letters to 53 square feet. And then the Belize letters 
are 20 inches at 16.3 square feet. And that's using a box to, to in, enclose each of those. So that's uh, 102 square feet altogether. What I'll know if you if you're in your mind's eye, recall the distance from the road of the building, whereas now, which I believe is compliant and, and compliant means 64 square feet, right? So we're asking for relief. We had asked for relief of more. We're asking for relief here um, from 64 to uh, 102. If we reduce this sign lower, then this uh, tower gets reduced. Instead of 11 feet, it becomes nine feet. And, and if you recall, the, the building itself really goes from here to here. And I'll, I'll bring back to the plan to, to talk about and to show that, but this service is stepped back and you can't really get the dimensions um, or the depth here in, in 3D because it, it appears in 2D. So we've got where the existing building is 63 feet to the road. This is 177 feet to the road. Um, and so this, and I'll get back to the plan, this is the signage package that we are proposing and, and we'd ask for approval. We're, we're back in front of the ZBA uh, next, you go back to here, um, next Tuesday evening to hopefully get, depending upon what the board does here, to get their approval. So I just want to kind of go back to the first slides that I was showing where you can see, you know, this I believe is you know, 64 square feet. It's what's allowed. The building's being pulled back here and you can see that step back. So to remain proportional, we'd like to keep this at 11 feet, which means that um, the, the signage that we're proposing at 33 square feet. And I know uh, Bill had heard this argument already, but I'll, I'll pitch it once more. You know, there's this sign that exists here, um, which is, I think, 74 <laughs> square feet would be coming down, right? So that we would be taking that down. There would be no sign there. There is no signage at this 303 rear Russell Street. There's obviously no building here. Um, the pylon sign, we're looking to keep but relocate so it's it's here it's uh i think about 50 square feet and it's internally illuminated we would be looking to use the exact same sign but to move it from where it is which is about let's say here maybe right here on the property if you're following my mouse to here so we're pulling it back from where it is um and and frankly up and so, you know, somewhat of the trade-off is with the moving back of the, the parked vehicles, uh, the relocation of the sign, hopefully to keep it internally illuminated, the pulling back of the building itself, elimination of this sign, not putting a sign here, et cetera. We were hoping that the board could support what I had showed with really just that emblem, the Subaru letters, and then the Belize letters. So that's the signage. I'm happy happy to stop and pause if we want to talk about that a little bit before we get to parking, or I can go right to parking. We can discuss it all. You have to, where is the sign going to go on the new property, Tom? Do you have a picture of the building with the new sign? I mean, a picture of what color the sign is going to be. The building is going to look like. Yes. Let are there are there any street signs, Tom? Yeah, there's a there's a freestanding sign. It's the one that exists right now. Right. Um, and it's 50, 64 square feet allowed. It's 50 square feet. They're looking to keep that internally illuminated and move it from where it is. And I have a, Jim, I can get a, stop this share. Let me get a couple of different plans that I can show you guys. I'll show you the pylon sign location and then I'll show you the rendering, Joe, so you'll see it. So if you're looking, so right here is where that existing sign is. Jim, if you can see that. 
Yeah, you see where that the rock wall is, and it's being pulled back here. Okay. So it'd be right. pulled, and and like I said, we'd use the exact same sign to pull it back to here. I mean, we could keep that sign there and just not touch it as a pre-existing nonconformity. It feels like this is probably, you know, with the relief that, if the Z, that the ZBA can grant with the support of the planning board, relocating it here seems to just make a lot more sense for a kind of a host of reasons. So that's number one. And then if I was smarter, Joe, I'd be able to do all this without shifting my screen around. But this is what it would look like uh, with the building, the amount of glass. Recall it's stepped back, you know, 177 feet from the property line. And this shows the originally proposed ones, Joe. This yep. is these are these are the bigger ones. These this would be reduced, reduced. This would be reduced, and that would be reduced. But that's that's the sign package that we're looking for, all externally illuminated. We're asking for internal internal illumination. We've heard the board. Let's do external illumination uh, for these. So you could put fourteen more square feet on the street, and you're not going to do it. So you're giving up fourteen square feet there. Correct. In exchange for internal illumination to keep that sign and hopefully some uh, good favor from the board for the balance of the request that we're asking for. Um, just, shows... just, prior, just prior to the meeting, I happened to just go online and look at number one, Belize Honda. And the building looks the same. The blue colors are the same. But the letterings on uh, Riverdale Road are much smaller. And also, too, Belize Toyota. They have the Toyota logo, as you have the Subaru logo, and, uh, and uh, a very modest uh, lettering. And then the Belize Hyundai, which happens to be on Cape Cod, has the logo name, the logo, as you show here, but one small Belize name, much smaller than the Belize name there. So I'm citing an example of three uh, Belize businesses, Honda, Toyota, and Hyundai, that are have signs much smaller than you're requesting. Is it that Hadley needs the bigger sign, or is it what you want to get away with? And I think you should maintain the si same size as you have in the other, the other areas. And number two, with your argument about the setback, just because it's set back, you need a bigger sign. The planning board proposed one of these uh, setback sign bylaws, and the town overwhelmingly voted it down. So we didn't even get a 50% majority. So it's not so much that the planning board can make the decision. It's the town that really made the decision. So. No, we, and we hear you. And I don't know, you know, the, the Subaru letters for what we're proposing are, are 30 inches, right? So if you just, I know they might look big, but it's they're they're 30 inches um, altogether. And the Belize is 20 inches, right? That's the height of the letters. And I don't know. And, you know, Jeff, I'm not going to put you on the spot or Alex. I don't know if either of you know the size because I didn't do the permitting for those other uh, Belize dealerships, Joe. So I don't know what they are. Um, but what I can say is what we're proposing. And so the 20 inches, I mean, you know what that's going to you can't see the bottom hand, but you know what that's going to look like, you know, 20 inches, especially. And I hear you and, and you know, Mr. Dwyer said the same thing about setback and you know, well, the town has not allowed that to be uh, an excuse for certain relief. I think there are other reasons here that you could rely on if if the board wanted to, and not just the setback. I'm trying to give it somewhat proportionality, in, including the size of the facade. Right, your your bylaw does say no more than ten percent of the facade, um, for a reason. Right, it it, it acknowledges architectural proportion. And so if you have signs that are too small, it just it it feels um, out of whack. And, you know, I know a lot of people do use Waze or Google Maps or whatever they're actually using to GPS the location. And with that Subaru sign out front, hopefully that's sufficient. But there is still some branding and mark that's needed here. So 
you know, I'll, I'll, I don't know if Jeff or um, one more editorial comment, Tom. Yeah. Uh, uh, we've had several people say it's the branding name. We must comply with Subaru's branding. And I remember when, uh, the, uh, Old Navy came in. They were going to have the sign projecting about 20 feet over the roof and about the letters of about 15 feet high, because that's what the branding was on the pier in Chicago. And they were not going to come if we didn't permit that sign. Well, we didn't permit the sign and they still came. And other signs, Kmart, Wal uh, Walmart, uh, Walco's, Wilco's, uh, uh, can you name some others? Uh, Steigers. All these had bigger, bigger signs, but th they're no longer in business. So it's the service that you're going to offer, not the signage. We we hear that. Um, yeah. I don't know, Jeff and or Alex, do you know anything about the signs at those other locate? If not, it's fine, but I figured I'll just... Uh... Um, if I may. So one item, especially the Toyota... Um, the the main thing with those dealerships is, if you're familiar with it, has a very big, white curved entrance. And brands like Toyota and Hyundai that were mentioned, they focus more on the building piece being, or they have a bigger icon than say the Subaru, where it's only that 11 foot wide tower, and that's more of their branding. And here, I think they look to kind of do it more with their wording instead of Toyota, where it's just that big white facade and then their emblem that's on it. So between the logo, the Subaru sign, and the Belize name, how many square feet is that? 102.43. That's all three put together? Correct. Or, or maybe we should consider the whole uh, stone structure as part of the sign. That's... that's you're way ahead of me, Bill. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, this isn't the, you know, I first came on the scene with Peter McConnell and we were talking about the the McDonald's swoosh, right? So I, I've I've learned from you all about what really counts as a, a mark. Um, you know, I haven't been to enough Subarus to know if and, and I would personally argue a, a stone column, you know, is not the McDonald's swoosh, right? That that McDonald's swoosh is indicative. You know, and I may kick myself for saying this, but, you know, you talk about gasoline canopy signage and the colors of Gulf or the colors of Cumberland Farms. Right. And and those are identifiers. And I could imagine um, like Best Buy. Right. It, that big tag. There are certain identifiers. I don't know that a stone, a tasteful stone column um, is. Oh, here's another Subaru. And I mean, that would be, I guess, our response to it. Um well, to your credit, that that uh, that tower could have been fifteen feet higher too. We'll take the credit, Joe. <laughs> so I I just hate to get into a position. I don't think the ZBA should be brought into this any more than it has to, and I don't think they should be giving variances for which there is no justification. So no, I'm not not going for even 102. Thank you for taking it down from 144, 164, but but we have a signed bylaw that was adopted by town meeting and what Hadley wants is smaller signage. And it may seem unfair because the reason we want smaller signage is that we didn't like what we were getting when we allowed larger signage. So unfortunately, you can find yourself in a position where you are next door to someone who has a much bigger sign and you can't have it. But that's the way it works. How much signage do you currently have? at Steve Lewis Subaru. I have to imagine it's conforming to 64 square feet, right? I think that's what's allowed. So I think that's probably what's there. I don't I don't know that it exceeds it, right? Otherwise I would probably I'm be having sure a different that conversation. It doesn't exceed it. It, it is it is the uh the the proper size, 64 square feet. 
And the result of it was one of the most contentious uh, planning board lawyer exchange uh, scenario that I've ever witnessed in my few years on the planning board. And never, I'll stop there. If I recall correctly, and I did mention this to Mr. Reedy, at, at that particular meeting, each member of the planning board had a different reason why they did not like the proposed signage. So there were, the, the attorney was faced with uh, attacks coming in from five directions. Okay, bless you. Um, so I guess a couple of things. Is there some number between 64 and 102 that is okay? Uh, that that the board, I mean, you've you've seen what the design is going to look like, right? It'll be the emblem, the Subaru letters, and the Belize letters. Is there some number that if we stay under, you are okay with it? And then we can at least go back and see, you know, what we can do. Uh, so that's, that's the first piece. And I'll start my second question. And then the second one is, you know, as far as that freestanding sign, being able to reuse that, and these may play off of each other. Um, you know, we'd like to be able to reuse that and to relocate it instead of keeping it in the exact same area. You know, I, I could probably build, you know, I, I'm doing variances for a while. Soil shape topography specifically affects the parcel, doesn't affect the zoning district generally, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Substantial financial, sub, substantial hardship financial or otherwise, right? We could come together and say, here's why we need this uh, for the signs. You may not buy it, but particularly for that, that freestanding sign with internal illumination as it's currently configured and as it's pre-existing non-conforming. And so maybe part of it is let us relocate that to where we're showing to relocate it. And then maybe some number between 64 and 102 could, could be satisfactory for the wall signs. Right. It's like Bill's saying, we've got to go to town meeting and get this changed. Huh? Yeah. I have no problem relocating the front to the roadside sign. Nor do I. Okay. That's just taking an existing sign and moving it, yeah. you know, 30 feet. Would be would would be my opinion pretty nasty to say you couldn't even reuse it. It's as long as it doesn't block the view exiting and entering, especially exiting. No, I think it's set far enough back from the road. I, I'm not proposing amending the sign by law. I'm quite happy with where it is. <laughs> well, it would probably fail. <laughs> but um... yeah, and I, I mean, I've just known the board that when there's something that's reasonable and, and makes sense, that I mean, the board is reasonable and, and makes sense. And so, you know, that's where we've started to talk about removal of the freestanding sign at 305, um, not having, you know, Harbor Freight is set. Like that has its signage. There was an additional 64 square feet that could have been put on the Rayos building. That's never going there. So the signage that you're going to see between the Harbor Freight site and the uh, 315 Russell Street site, that's the signage that's going to be in that area, right? We're not going to go get one in the back. There's not going to be another freestanding sign up front. So you're going to have, you have the Harbor Freight freestanding sign, You've got, and that's max that I'm going to say that's probably uh, 50 square feet or something like that because they were trying to build in enough area for rails, but nothing's going there. So that's cap. The Harbor Freight signs are the Harbor Freight signs. And then at 315, you've got a 50 foot freestanding sign and then whatever you're going to allow on the building. So just to put it into perspective, you know, on this new building, 177 feet back off the uh, um, property line that's the signage that you're going to have uh, in that area. In as much as you brought up Harbor Freight, now you realize that part of the negotiation there was to take down the giant billboard that was in front of the property. And there was some, some trading going on there. And by the way, that sign should almost be ready to be coming 2027, down. 2027, I think. We already told them they tried to renew it. And we sold it. I sent them a letter. I said... No, <laughs> this is it. When you're done, it's done. <laughs> so, Tom, 
you're if i heard you right earlier you're suggesting that you are 14 square feet under on your your pylon sign i i can't imagine the board giving you any more if they even gave you that 14 on the building but that would be the only you know that would be the arguable maximum i could i could stomach would say you know your total didn't change you borrowed from here to go there but i'm not sure that will even fly with my colleagues that's why i asked that question yeah i figured that was the play mark <laughs> what what is the board consider about that idea you, what do you mean moving the pylon sign no, okay no 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 no, no. leaving oh. the pile relocating the pylon sign yeah. But taking the 14 square feet that they're allowed from the pylon and add that to the building to the 64. So let's say you round it off to be 80 square feet. But what are they going to pick up say the pylon sign is going to remain the same size? <clears throat> yes, it's going to remain the same size, but yes. it's less than 64 square feet to start with. Well, now you get rid of the pre-existing non-conforming use. Uh, so that's that's... And we're getting rid of the 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 sign that was at Rayos, which I think is pre-existing non-conforming also, which I think exceeds your I think it's 74 square feet based on my lawyer math, but that's where I think it comes out to be. And that would be coming down as well, just to throw that into the kitty. Well, you can't have that anyway now that you've joined the lots. You can only have one pylon sign. But uh, I'm okay with uh, Mark Dunn's rationale that if you're 14, if you have, a, what, 14 unused square feet on the pylon sign, maybe we could add that to the 64. 64. And I like that Jim rounded up to 80 just to give us a nice even number. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Does that sound reasonable to everybody? Reasonable. Yeah. We appreciate that, certainly. And we'll go back to the drawing board and, and we'll, uh, I'll report this to the Zoning Board of Appeals on Tuesday night. And hopefully they've still got to grant the variance for it, but at least I'll tell them that this was the discussion. And Mr. Dwyer, I can save you a trip if you want. I think you know I'm a man of my word. If you want to come, I'm always happy to see you. Um. <laughs> I would come, but I'll be out of state. <laughs> uh, Mark the wrench will be there. Um, okay, just, and then just just for the record on the sign, let's just make a motion that so you can go to the ZBA with a unanimous decision of the planning board on that term. Okay, that'd be great. Can you make the motion, Bill, or I mean make it. Uh, yeah, just a second. Let me finish up from sixty-four <laughs> square feet to eighty square feet. Okay. I'll make a motion that it's the sense of the planning board that uh, to allow Subaru or Belize to borrow the unused 14 square feet from the pylon sign and add that to the building allowance for up to 80 square feet. Okay. Sounds like weird. That's the motion. Sounds and like do you want to support the right. relocation of that freestand of the freestanding sign? Just because that's in front of them too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Support the relocation okay. as well of the existing roadside sign. Okay. Let me just, I can write this a little more intelligibly in a second. <laughs> we have a picture of that existing. I mean, does it have any height concerns or no? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think okay. it's, uh, right. I, I can look, but. All right. Well, while Bill, Bill is saying it, it's it's amazing that the sophisticated drainage on this site was <laughs> was presented and pretty much ratified by our peer review engineer 
with very, very little uh, question mark. That was very well done. Yeah, and it's unfortunate that that uh, those undergrounds won't perk. So it's only a, well, that that it's whole area there is coming, instead of retaining for, yeah. for the old timer. It's Joe Z, Bill, and myself. Remember when it used to be a cucumber field for <laughs> Mountain Farms Mall? Is yes. it was a little bit of a wet year. They had a tractor pulling a tractor pulling the cucumber fields through the field because it was so wet and muddy. Wow. Well, wow. and and the fine the fine uh, uh, particles that are referring to it sand is fine, but clay is much finer. Hence, mm -hmm. so it doesn't drain. Well, if, if you remember the Harbor Freight, so that was obviously Keats of Lumber and, you know, Barry got in, rolled his sleeves up and it was all clay and silt and just layers upon layers of, I mean, that's what you get in this area, you know. When it, when it, yeah, when, when it rained, the, the lumber field was a big mud hole. <laughs> <laughs> that's putting it mildly. <laughs> okay, let me run this one by. Uh, make make uh, a motion to okay, accept the go. digital 14, uh, to allow an additional, to accept the additional 14 square feet to be added to the allowed 64 square feet, rounding up to 80 square feet, and move the pylon sign as shown, retaining internal illumination for the pylon sign. That's the motion. Second that. We have motion a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none. All in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is unanimous. Good. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Um, then last, maybe sticky wicket of the evening uh, is parking. And so, you know, obviously your uh, bylaw reads the way it reads as far as parking and, and display area. What we've got is 31,563 square feet of area, including the mezzanine, plus 4,805 square feet here for a total of 36,000 368 square feet. Uh, the outside inventory is another 15,795 square feet. So altogether, buildings and outside inventory uh, footprint, we are talking about 52,161 square feet. And so at a two to one ratio, we, we need 104,322 square feet. At a one and a half to one, which you can grant under TDR, we need 78,244 square feet. We have provided 84,246 square feet. So that means if we are at that two to one, we are short 20,000 square feet rounded. If we're at 1.5 to one, we comply. If you just take the buildings and assume that the parking area uh, one for one, and then uh, at two to one for the buildings. So the, the buildings together, 36,368, two times it, 72,736. We have 84,000 and some change square feet. So if you just took the buildings, we would comply uh, two to one. Um, if you take buildings plus outdoor display at one and a half to one, we would comply if you take buildings and outdoor display at uh, two to one, we would be 20,000 square feet short. So that's that's where it is. And we can talk about what the solution to that is. Could any of the green area be used as parking, but not necessarily right now? For for us, no. Paved is what's, uh, you've got the parking areas here. This rest is landscape. We comply with all other dimensional requirements, say for this, which we got a, a finding for, but we comply with open space. We comply with uh, max building, max coverage of buildings. So we're we're good everywhere else. Um, parking will be on a, a paved surface. Display will be on a paved surface. Yeah, I'm not asking you to use it. Is, is it possible, but not potential? If, if we've, we've been down this road before. Yeah. Saying, no? Okay. Um, I mean, I could say yes, but I don't think, I mean, we could count this, but I don't know that anybody wants vehicles there. You know, it's like the honesty trade-off, I guess. 
screen froze. I'm, I, I mean, related, uh, you're talking about the maximum area. I still have the concern about on the east side um, having the fire and police make sure that that serves their purposes. What was it with the with the new library? There was some the they had to widen the driveway because it wasn't to what was the minimum? Did anyone remember that? They I, th I think they built it to one size and chief required it to be wider. Yeah, that was the turning radius for entrance, uh, that, and also, yeah, too, you're right, along the north side of the library, it was tight if they parked the car there. Well, we'll get this reviewed by the fire chief, and we'll, we'll whatever okay. he, well, we'll find out. Okay. Um, so getting back to, to Mr. Reedy's point. I'm willing to let the display parking go one for one because it's display. But the thing is, the, the display is cars, and that's being used by cars. So as far as I'm concerned, that's a wash. Then I would say, if that's the case, then we comply. Because our, our building uh, to, to parking ratio is two to one. We've, we've got it uh, with 12,000 square feet to spare. Not now, you said you're, you're supplying 84,000 square feet of parking. Does that include the display parking? It does not. We took the total, you'll see down here, total paved surface, 100,000 square feet, took that outdoor display out of there. And so that's where we get that 84,246. Now, is that including the entire parcel? That's going around the old rows. Yeah. Okay. Correct. It's everything. Yeah. Well, that includes that. Well, of course, that includes back of rails, which is a lot of lot of parking area there that you're not using for display, right? right. Correct. Right. Okay. I can say there's no way you get 84,000 around the building, but if you include the rails, yeah, there's there's a decent okay. amount there. Yeah. Okay. If that's the case, I, for one, am good with the parking as they've got it. I know the rest of the board feels fine. I think the improvements are appreciated. I'm just, again, I'm just not to harp on it. I'm just concerned about the tight dimension on the east. Yeah, I and mean, I will. I actually, um, do we have a paper copy of this, Mister Reedy? I think, you should. I think yes, you do. should. I. I dropped them off. I think we yeah, have. Yeah, I think I do. Have, I I know I gave the chief a copy. Then I will see the chief t tomorrow, I believe, and find out if he's good. Okay. Okay. Is it easier? I mean, you know, I'm always going to push for a decision if we can get a decision, even if it's conditioned on the chief. I don't want to put. I don't know what Mr. Dwyer is with approval of this with any conditions, etc. Uh, is it appropriate to ask for an approval this evening subject to that condition just to wrap it up? And then if the chief wants some changes, we can always come back with those changes once we've looked at it instead of kicking it over for another two weeks, uh, you know, seeing what happens by that point. If we've got everybody here, we've made the presentation, not to refresh anybody's memory in the future, that would be my request. Um, I have one have you thought about pedestrian, you know, let's say I come in and you're going to service my car and I say, I'll stay. And then I want to walk to the mall. Can I get to the Route 9 sidewalk? You're going to have to go on the grass, I guess, right? Yeah, you would have to either go on the grass or, you know, I would assume you'd probably walk here, which is the outgoing. Mm-hmm lane to there um i would bet there and steve you can jump in but you know i start to think of ada access and sidewalk and and slopes and cross slopes and all those things um that i don't know that we would be able to meet if there was a sidewalk here 
without some pretty serious ground manipulations, if it's even possible. Practically, though, somebody could just leave here. And I know Subaru has a courtesy vehicle as well. But if somebody wanted to take a nice stroll, you know, they could get onto that path this way. Yes. Oh, just to clarify, the access drive could be ADA accessible. Any, anything more than 5% would be considered a rail. Yeah. So that would only mean that rails would have to be, but we are flattening it intentionally to make it easier for delivery vehicles. Hmm. And I believe we will be no more than 5% at the new driveway. Just along the same lines, and I know that the state is not eager to allow access to the rail trail. Is that anything that anyone has looked at, or is there an existing uh, informal connection back there? I think there's an existing informal connection back there. Um, obviously, there's, you know, if you've been down there, there's a down and up that has like a wetland swale that was created by what the work that was done yep. um but i that's bill that's a great point um i don't know that we would ask for something formal back there because it would technically be altering the wetland but if there's i think there's a cow path i'll call it back there where folks can practically get on that path and travel safely okay just just another thought about people dropping their car off and riding their bike to work or what have you no that's that's smart um so there's also the the we want to see your new signage tom okay okay just i think we've kind of just assumed this all along i'm you do you want to remind us what the property is to your east east is chinese immersion school yeah oh yeah and so there wouldn't well the, be... the, the uh, chinese immersion school has basically been blocked from going to the mall. So I don't think you want to try to go across back lots. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. That's that's a that's a touchy subject with them. It seems like it. Yeah. Marshalls was not happy. Yeah. Okay, Bill. So it sounds like fire chief sign off and Jim will take care of that and then come back with signage we'll we'll once we spin it up we'll we'll supply it to you and then hopefully you know two weeks from now we can get a, a final uh, approval with conditions for the project and then we can get going sounds neat fire chief and signage and uh did you mention a third thing Tom, Tom Quinlan has got his hand up. He's had it up for a while. I just wanted to mention that Fire Chief is is off this week for Mr. Maximowski. Oh, he is. He is. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll see him next week. Yep. You he'll, he'll be back on Monday. Yes. Okay. So we did promise Pioneer Valley Planning Commission that we were not going to put a lot on uh, our next agenda, but I think we can probably slip this one in if it's just a matter of seeing the... It, um, it'll, it'll just should be met if, the, if we got the signage in, it's good, and the fire chief is good with the uh, part, with the drive around, it's just going to be a matter of making the motion. Yeah. Okay. I'll make a motion to continue the public hearing to uh, April 16th. Okay. Oh, 630. Is there 6 645 or 630? 630? 645. 645. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion on it? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. See you in two weeks. Thanks, Thank Thanks so much, guys. Good seeing you. Thank you all. Thanks. Um Mr. Quinlan, do you have anything? No. Does your assistant have anything? Lost. <laughs>
the boss lady. Kyla, are you good? All good. Okay. I have nothing, nothing else. else. Motion to adjourn. Um, did you uh so I'm were you interested in the uh committee on the 40R? We're working on I almost have the membership of that and we're probably gonna schedule toward the end of the month. Or do you not need me to report back on that? No. No, just let us know when you have a meeting. Okay. That's all. This is you're the chairman. Just make sure it's published accordingly or posted. Yep. And you call the shots. Okay. So I think I have incorporated that into the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission agenda item anyway. Okay. So we can talk about it in, in two, two weeks. weeks. Yep. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.